welcome to lecture 3b dynamic scheduling to explore instruction level parallelism last video lecture we have seen how compiler techniques helps in improving instruction level parallelism we have learned about the concept of what is instruction scheduling which will reduce stalls created by structural hazards data hazards and control hazards we have seen also how compiler is playing a proactive role in understanding the dependency between the instructions and compiler is able to understand instruction combinations that will produce hazards so the dependent instructions are rearranged in such a way that we could effectively reduce or minimize and eliminate stalls that are been created in that way compiler is playing a very proactive role we also learned that to facilitate compiler scheduling the hardware need to communicate with compiler or architectural aspects of the hardware need to be exchanged with the compilers so architecture knowledge is must at the compiler level since architecture designing and compiler designing is done by two companies generally sharing of such knowledge always may not be that easy so such kind of a closer ecosystem wherever it is working compiler scheduling is good but there are certain challenges also because certain kind of instructions it is very difficult to understand these kind of dependencies and hazards at the compiler level since compiler level optimization is not always possible we are going to explore another area that is called dynamic scheduling to explore instruction level parallelism we will learn about how dynamic scheduling is possible or how can you equip the computer hardware to reduce stalls and to improve instruction level parallelism without much help and support from compilers so straight away moving to dynamic scheduling to explore instruction level parallelism so the whole idea of dynamic scheduling is to rearrange execution order of instructions to reduce stalls while maintaining the data flow so let's try to understand in the case of a compiler scheduling which is also known as static scheduling versus hardware scheduling or also known as dynamic scheduling so in this case compiler is going to give you some sequence it may be these are the set of the instructions given by the program and compiler is going to reorganize these instructions and this is what is coming to hardware so hardware is going to run instructions only in the same order what compiler has given that is what is called compiler scheduling so eventually the order of instructions is changed by the compiler but once it comes to the hardware hardware is strictly going to follow the order given by compiler now whereas in the case of hardware scheduling these are the order of instructions what is given by the programmer now when it comes to hardware hardware is going to reorder the instructions in different format that is the idea so rearrange the execution order of instructions to reduce stalls while maintaining data flow so this rearrangement of instructions before giving for execution is what is there in compiler scheduling or static scheduling rearrangement of execution order of instruction to reduce stalls is basically what is called a dynamic scheduling now the advantage of going for this kind of an approach is here compiler doesn't need to have knowledge of micro architecture the hardware manufacturing company need not share its internal details to a compiler development company so compiler doesn't need to know all about this knowledge and there are certain dependencies which we cannot find out at compile time we will come to know such kind of dependency only at run time i would like to draw your attention to one such dependency where we cannot know whether there exist a dependency or not so consider the case that you are going to have an add instruction on r1 r2 and r3 now i am going to perform a subtraction instruction on r6 with r1 and r3 let's say r5 now this is actually you are going to have a dependency because the name r1 you can see that it comes as the resultant or destination register for add instruction and the same r1 come as the source operand for the subtraction instruction so these kind of dependency 
while the compiler generates the instruction, this kind of similarity in names of the operands can be easily understood and if at all you require any such kind of operation. So, imagine that use is going to be a floating point add and floating point subtraction. Even with operand forwarding, f add and f sub cannot happen in adjacent cycles. I have to wait for a minimum of 3 cycles. These data dependencies are easy to resolve at compile time. Now, here the point what they are telling why what are the advantages of dynamic scheduling is sometimes when the dependencies are unknown at compile time. Let me draw your attention to one such case where dependency is not known at the runtime. So, consider the case that you are going to perform a store operation where the content of R2 into 8 of R1 and then I am going to have a load operation into R6 on 24 of R3. So, look at this case, there is a store operation and immediately after the store operation, we have a load operation. Now, is this store or load dependent? What do you mean by dependency of a load and store? So, think of a case, this is memory location. Now, my store instruction is going to write into this memory and my load instruction is going to read from the memory location. So, if this load and store are dependent, then the store instruction will write into a location and the same location is read by the load. So, in this case, I cannot exchange the order of the load and store because they are dependent. The loaded value is same as what is stored, meaning the load instruction can happen only after the store instruction is over. So, when can I say that they both are same? They both are same. It is very obvious in this case, let us say there is a store instruction of R2, let us say 0 of R1. Now, I am telling there is a load instruction on R8, 0 of R1. So, in this case, store is going to write an instruction whose memory address is given by 0 plus R1 and the load is also going to read from a location whose memory address is 0 plus R1. In this case, write from the name of the base register and the displacement looking at this similarity, it is clear that they both are pointing into the same location. So, this is a clear case of dependency which even a compiler can understand because the name of the base register R1 is same and the offset is also same. This is actually dependency. Now, the challenge is, is this a dependency? This will become, these two instructions are going to be dependent if 8 plus content of R2 is equal to 24 plus content of R3. That is the dependency. This can be same. We will come to know only if you add up the value of R1 with 8 and R3 plus 24. So, by simply looking at the instructions and the operands, we do not find there is a dependency. These dependencies we will come to know only after computation of effective address. This is the case what is mentioned here. Handling cases where dependencies are unknown at compile time. This can be resolved only at runtime. So, compiler cannot reorganize. So, if compiler try to reorganize them seeing that there are no dependency between them, then it is going to create troubles. Now, what are the disadvantage of hardware scheduling? There is substantial increase in the hardware complexity, that is one thing. Our hardware is going to have more complexity because hardware need to understand hazards and hardware need to have mechanisms by which it will try to reorder the instruction and then whenever there is an exception that is happening, that is also going to complicate the scenario. So, why it is dynamic scheduling? Dynamic scheduling is basically the approach in which given a set of instructions, hardware will understand what are the dependencies, what are the instructions that can go, what are the instructions that can be reordered and based upon that execution of instructions is being reordered based on the requirement with a target of trying to reduce the number of stalls, trying to explore instruction level parallelism. The advantage is with respect to compile time scheduling or the limitations of compile time scheduling is Runtime dependencies are not known at the compile time scheduling, which will be knowing at runtime. And the second aspect is the micro architectural feature of the hardware need not be exchanged with the compiler, need not be informed with the compiler. But naturally, the hardware is going to become more complex and uh, it will take uh, more power 
or more area in the chip once you have a more intelligent hardware that can understand hazards. Moving further, let us try to understand how dynamic scheduling works. Now, whatever pipeline we have learned so far is called a simple pipeline. So, what do you mean by a simple pipeline? Consider the case that you have instructions like this. And all these instructions, let us, I am going to number the instruction 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, these instructions are going to be executed in order. That is called in order instruction issue and execution that is happening in the case of a simple in order pipeline. That is known as an in order pipeline. Now, in the case of an in order pipeline, instructions are fetched in order, decoded in order, executed in order. That is the way how it is been done. Now, in multi cycle pipeline, there can be cases of instructions completing out of order, but still the issue happens in order. Instructions are issued, issued means giving the operands of the instructions to the functional units, they are issued in the program order. Now, if by chance you just imagine that your add instruction cannot proceed, let us say the adder is not available. So, if an instruction is stalled in the pipeline, whatever be the reason, let it be a structural hazard then no later instruction can proceed. This will actually prevent all the subsequent instructions from getting issued. So, in a conventional in order pipeline, all instructions are issued in order, issue is in the program order. If at all any instruction is stalled due to a hazard, it can be a structural hazard or it can be data hazard, whatever it is, all other subsequent instructions are also being stalled. Now, consider the case you have a division instruction on floating point. As I have mentioned in the last lecture, whenever we have the registers which are starting with F, F0, F2, F4 like that, they are floating point registers, meaning the data is double. So, think of a case that you have a division operation on F2 and F4. So, essentially this means F0 will be loaded with F2 divided by F4. It is a division operation and we have seen that division will take close to 24 cycles. Now, the very next add instruction is having a raw dependency on F0. So, even though the adder is free, the second add instruction cannot proceed because a division instruction that is there is taking longer time. Now, if you look at the subtraction instruction, let us assume that adding and subtraction is being done in a different unit or let us say you can actually do the subtraction because the operands of subtraction F8 and F14 are available. So, as far as the subtraction operation is concerned, the functional unit that carry out the operation that is there, that is free, the operands on which the operation is to be done, the contents of F18 and F14 are ready. But in the case of an in order pipeline, subtraction instruction is stalled because the previous add instruction cannot start because its operands are not ready. This scenario if an instruction j depends on a long running instruction i currently in execution in pipeline, all instructions after j must be stalled until i is finished and j can execute. So, if an instruction add that is been mentioned over here, if an instruction add is dependent on a long running instruction division that is already in the pipeline, all instructions after add that is from sub onwards down are stalled, cannot be executed until i is finished first, until division is over and followed by j can execute. So, why there is a restriction? Can we think of an option which can still improve and that is what dynamic scheduling is all about. So, consider the same set of instruction. So, what we do in dynamic scheduling is separate the issue process into two portion. Step number one is checking for any structural hazards second one is waiting for the absence of a data hazard. So, what is the structural hazard as far as this instruction is concerned? If the division unit is not available, if it is not free, that is called a structural hazard. If division unit is available, but if the values F2 and F4 is not ready, that is called a data hazard. Now, in this case, you can see that as far as the add instruction is concerned, there is no structural hazard, but there is a data hazard. Adder is available but the value of F0 is not available because it is dependent on the previous division instruction. So, if we can divide the issue process into checking of structural hazard and waiting for the absence of data hazard, then that is how dynamic scheduling works. So, 
use in order instruction issue, but we want an instruction to begin execution as soon as data operands are available. So, issue means if you are free from structural hazard, perform the issue and as and when the data is available, let us run. So, if an in you, if the issue is in order, add will be issued, that means it is going to the adder and it is waiting in the input of adder for the value of F0 to be ready. So, with F8 value, I can wait in the adder and as and when F0 is available, add can proceed. In the meantime, for subtractor, let us say if the functional unit is available and if F8 and F14 is there, so there is no structural hazard, the adder or the subtractor unit is free, operands are also ready. So, this will permit the subtraction operation to start execution before the adder starting execution. So, this will lead to out of order execution. See, this is the order. Division is the order adder. So, division is in progress. Adder has not started, but subtractor will start or subtraction instruction will start. This will lead to out of order execution and naturally, it will lead to out of order completion as well. So, out of order execution will naturally result in the possibility of war and wow hazard which we have seen. So, what is a war hazard? A war hazard is a case wherein you have a right after read hazard. If an instruction is going to write on a data after some other instruction is going to read on a data. So, one such example is if we have one instruction, let us say an add instruction R2, R1 and R0. Now, you have a subtraction instruction on R0, R5 and R6. Now, in this case, if you look at the instruction sequence, you can see that there is an R0 from which the add instruction is going to read and there is an R0 to which the subtraction instruction is going to write. Normally, if you see, if it is an in-order pipeline, then the add will read the contents of R0 and R1 and then only the subtraction is going to write because reading from R0 and R1 happens in the ID stage of the add instruction and writing into R0 will happen in the WB stage of sub. Now, if sub is permitted to run before the add, then sub will write into R0 and when add tries to read, add is going to read the wrong R0 and that is exactly what a war hazard is. Interchanging of these add and sub instruction will result in war. But so far in the in-order pipelines, we have seen such a kind of an interchanging will never happen. So, when add is waiting, sub is also waiting. So, when you permit out of order execution, then these kind of scenarios can happen. Similarly, we can have wow hazard as well. So, this wow hazard typically happens when you have a scenario where your subtraction is also going to be on R2. So, if subtraction is on R2, then both add and subtract are going to use the same destination register. So, ideally this means subtraction should write into R2 only after add writes into R2. So, if the order is violated, then that can lead to write after write hazards. So, dynamic scheduling is the process by which out of order execution is permitted and this out of order execution can result in war and wow hazards. Now, how dynamic scheduling works? War and wow hazards has to be addressed if you wanted to go for dynamic scheduling. So, think of a case what happens here. When you have a division instruction which is dependent on F0 and then you have a sub instruction which is not dependent on anything. So, this is F10 and F14. So, this is going to write into F8 and this F8 is what is being used. So, now if you look at here, this division is taking long time. So, add is going to wait, sub will start execution and once sub is over, that will permit multiplication to complete its operation. And once multiplication is completed, then it will write into F6 because multiplication is only dependent on the subtraction. So, once subtraction is over, it will permit multiplication to carry out its operation, it will write to F6. And if you write to F6 and later only add is going to write to F6 and that will happen as a wow hazard. Now, the possibility is sometimes you can get an imprecise exception. 
So, we will try to understand what is an imprecise exception all about. A pipeline may have already completed instruction that are later in the program order than the instruction causing an exception. Let us try to understand this imprecise exception with the same example itself. Now, think of a case we are currently doing division instruction and because of that the add instruction is waiting. Now, imagine that your subtraction instruction is permitted to run. So, that means F10 and F14 will go into the subtractor and the result is produced in F8 and imagine that your subtraction instruction is now complete. Once the subtraction instruction is complete, assume that the division caused an error. It can be an exception. Let us say F4 value was equal to 0, division by 0 might have happened. So, if the operand, if the divisor is going to be 0, then division is not defined. It will lead to an exception, division by 0 exception. So, let us imagine this is the first instruction, the add is third. The third instruction is completed, it will update the value of F8, but the first instruction will come to know that the division operation is not possible. So, first instruction encountered with an exception, in the meantime, a later instruction has actually completed. Such an exception is called an imprecise exception. We cannot handle an exception. Generally, what happens when you get an exception is, you have to roll back all the, the instructions that are partially over and make sure that all instructions before division is complete. Since the subtraction has already changed the state of the registers, meaning F8 is updated, any kind of a recovery mechanism will become difficult. The pipeline may not have yet completed some instruction that are earlier in the program order than instruction causing the exception. Yet another way is, form of exception is, imagine that your multiplication has encountered an exception. Can I handle that exception? Can I go for an exception service routine? No, you cannot go to an exception service routine on the multiplier until all instructions before this multiplication is over. So, these two cases, a pipeline may have already completed instruction that are later in the program order than instruction causing exception. The one that I told, division is creating an exception when subtractor is already complete or the pipeline may have not had completed some instruction that are earlier in the program order that instruction causing the exception. So, while you deal with dynamic scheduling, we have to deal with war and wow hazard that will happen and that is done by register renaming concept and then you have to deal with exceptions that is crossing. Now, to allow out of order execution, what we do is we split the ID stage into two. Stage one is known as issue, decode the instructions, check for structural hazards if any and if there is no structural hazard, then you go to the read operands phase, wait until no data hazard and then correspondingly read operands. In a dynamically scheduled pipeline, all instructions pass through the issue stage, stage number 1. This is stage number 1, issue stage in order that is called in order issue. However, they can be stalled or bypass each other in the second stage or read operands, thus entering the execution out of order. Now, we will see as far as an instruction once the fetching is over, the next thing is try to understand what the operation is. Let us say if you come to know it is a multiplication, next stage is go to the multiplier, get the operands, perform the operation. So, issue means trying to understand what the operand that is called decoding. Try to understand what is the functional unit I wanted to perform operation on multiplication. Is multiplier freely available? Then I am free from structural hazard. This much level, then I am issuing, I am just going and waiting in the queue for the multiplier. Issue has to do in order. Now, the operands may not be available. So, those instructions which are already issued, but if the operands are available, they will run. But those instructions which are issued, if operands are not available, they will wait. So, issue has to be order and execution can be out of order based upon the availability of operands. So, in short, dynamic scheduling means divide the instruction issue into two sub stages, read, make sure there is no structural hazard, issue in order and then wait for the data as and when data is available, carry with the execution. Now, how it has been done? It has been done by a technique known as scoreboarding technique and the approach used is the Thomas Ullo's algorithm. Now, we will see how register renaming is done. So, consider there are 
there is a sequence of program of instructions wherein your add is going to write into f6 and multiplication is also going to write into f6. Now, look at the sequence of program. There is a dependency between the division because of this f0 dependency. Because of that, this add is going to wait and then we are supposed to store the value. Since the value of f6 is not available, I cannot even perform the store. Now, the subtraction operation is going to work f10 and f14 and f8 is the resultant as and when f8 is available multiplication is going to write into f6. So, here f6 is the problem the add and multiplication are going to operate on f6. It is only a name dependency had this f6 been replaced with some fx then there is no issue like a wow hazard here. So, this is something that has been created. So, what I can do is these two are the same thing that is going to work and uh, these are the same thing that is going to talk about. So, as and when this s is available then only the store can go as and when the t is available then only I can go and this is the actual f6. So, now we have a raw hazard that is on t. So, they will be dependent on each other. I am renaming this f6 with some temporary register. So, the add value will be returned to a temporary register s which is used by the store in order to write. So, they need not update on the real f6 that is not happening but only the multiplication instruction is going to update on f6. So, temporarily the name f6 that was used here is being now using a different one that is the way how it is been processed. This whole step is known as register renaming rather than using the name f6 some temporary register is being used. This register renaming is done with the help of reservation stations. So, every functional unit will have reservation stations which tells the instruction or operation to be done. It will, it will buffer the operand values when they are available. Reservation station number of instructions providing the operand values. Reservation station fetches and buffers an operand as soon as it becomes available not necessarily involving the register file. And pending instruction designate the reservation station that will provide an input. So, consider this is one functional unit A and this is another functional unit B. Now, the reservation station of A means I am supposed to perform a plus operation on 5 and 6. So, 6 and 5 are the, op are the values as and when A is free then this is been taken. Similarly, another entry of the reservation station can be told as I have a value to be 7. Let us say 7 is my operand and I am waiting for a value to be produced by B. So, as and when V produces the result that value will come over here. So, this minus instruction or subtraction instruction is actually waiting for an operand which is to be produced by functional unit B whereas, this is ready as and when the functional unit is ready this will go. So, reservation station is nothing but it is a set of buffers that are associated with functional units and this buffer contain the operation that is to be performed. So, in this case this plus and minus are the operations. Second one it will buffer the value. So, if the value is available you take the value and keep it ready if the value is not available. So, in this case one operand is available where a second operand is not available it is yet waiting for the operand due to it is it is basically because of a raw hazard. So, if it is waiting it has to tell for which reservation station it is waiting. So, it is actually waiting for a result that is to be produced by B. So, reservation station number of instruction providing the operand values. So, reservation station fetches and buffers an operand as soon as it becomes available. All pending instructions you will tell which reservation station will produce. We will learn about how this the reservation station works while we work with the Tomasolo algorithm that will come in the next lecture. Now, the peculiarity is all these things the result of each of this functional unit has to be broadcasted on a common data bus that is what is been mentioned over here it is called CDB. So, every functional unit is connecting to a common data bus and everybody is waiting in this we will see the architectural diagram also. So, this is how it looks like you have the instructions that is been fed this is the instruction queue and during the decoding operation let us say these are all adders these are the functional units 
these are the multipliers another category of functional unit this is the memory unit which will take care of load and store. So, you pick an instruction from here look at the operand and then you feed them into reservation station. So, you can see these are all queues you have your adder floating point adder there is a 3 entry reservation station this is a true entry reservation station. So, the values if at all if the operands are available you go to the registers and uh, you put the values in the reservation station. Now, as and when the, the functional unit is free and the values are available the entries from the reservation stations are been taken and are put into the adders or subtractors or multiplies whatever functional unit and they are going to produce the result. Now, you have to see that this common data bus is connected to the input side of the reservation station. So, if anybody is waiting for any value you will get the value at the same time if the if the result is to be returned to the registers it is going to be updated there. Now, look at the load and store you have an address computation that happens. So, if you have a load instruction let us say load r 1 comma 0 of r 8 let us say 8 of r 8. So, the address unit computes r 8 plus 8 and uh, that will give you the, the effective address. Now, with the effective address you go to memory unit and this is the process of load. Now, if it is a process of a store the address unit will produce the address this is the place where you store the address and the data to be written that is available here. So, that is generally produced by these functional units and you get the values to be written. So, store has a value as well as an address whereas, the case of a load it is only the value that is available. So, the output of memory unit is also connected to the same common data bus if a value if a loaded value is needed then that also is being obtained in the input of the reservation stations. So, in Tomasolo algorithm which is the most prominent algorithm that uh, will take care of dynamic scheduling we have a detailed session one lecture exclusively for Tomasolo algorithm working during that time it will be more clear today before winding up I am just summarizing what are the important aspects of Thomas Ullo's algorithm. So, in Thomas Ullo algorithm issue means you get the next instruction from the FIFO queue if reservation station is available issue the instruction to the reservation station with whatever operands available at that point of time. So, consider the case you have an add instruction R 2, R 3 and R 1. So, if the value if the reservation station is available means if the adder has a reservation station which has space available then I will issue into the reservation station if the value of R 3 and R 1 is there go with them if value of only R 3 is there go with R 3 and R 1 you will get it from some other instruction. If operand values are not available then even if it is going to the, the reservation station it cannot enter into the execution stage. Now, what happened in the execute in the case of execute these are the operations that are waiting in reservation station when the operand become available store it in the reservation station waiting for it that is what you have to do when all the operands are ready as far as an instruction waiting in the reservation is concerned you execute the instruction. So, when an execution is over update all the reservation stations some of the following instructions may be waiting for the result of this when all operands are available for instructions waiting in reservation station carry out the operation loads and store has to be using buffers that is what we have seen in the diagram no instruction will initiate execution until all branches that precede it in the program order has completed. So, this is how you deal with control hazard so, think of it is that there is a branch instruction that is halfway. So, if we have a branch instruction and there are some other instructions after the branch I cannot execute those instructions because at the point of execution if the branch condition is not resolved once I start execution it will produce a result it will change the value of my registers it is very difficult to unroll it back. So, execution of instructions after a branch will happen only if you are sure that this instruction is must execute that means as far as the outcome of a branch is concerned this instruction will be executed. So, whenever there is a branch all other subsequent instructions are going to wait and execution is been delayed. And how will you write the result? We have seen that all the functional units are connected to a common data bus. So, you write the result into common data bus thereby it reaches the reservation station store buffer and register file. 
Now, let me get told this is a functional unit A and this is another functional unit B and if there is a common data bus and uh, how will somebody know this value let us say I am producing a value x in the bus, how will somebody know the value x that is been written into the bus is produced by A or B? Because somebody may be waiting for a result produced by A and somebody may be waiting for a result produced by B. So, it is very important that the name of the execution unit that generated the result. So, it is basically like A produced a value x, similarly B produced a value y. So, along with the value you have to produce which functional unit has generated the result and stores must wait until address and values are being received. So, that is the way how you perform the right result. So, with that we are coming to the end of this lecture, a quick summary of what we learned today. On the previous class, our focus was on how can compiler helps in reorganizing instructions to improve performance of pipeline and in today's lecture, we were looking at yet another alternative model that is called dynamic scheduling. In dynamic scheduling, you are trying to execute instructions out of order. So, when one instruction cannot proceed due to a dependency or a hazard, all other instructions after that need not be waiting. So, instructions that have functional unit ready, that have operands ready are permitted to execute. For that, the, the issue stage is been divided into two, issue happen in in order and reading of operands can happen out of order and this is implemented using Tomasulo's algorithm and the concept of register renaming will take care of your war and wow hazards and this Tomasulo algorithm will take care of dynamic scheduling. So, with that we conclude, thank you.